In this short video series, I'm going to build a ZX Spectrum based on what we understand so far about how it works. To get some background into the architecture of the Spectrum, I suggest you watch this video where I go over the design in more detail. I'm still going to use a Z80 CPU, but instead of an uncommitted logic array, I'm going to use an EEPROM instead. If you want a sneak peek at how I'm going to do this, you might want to watch this VGA from an EEPROM video. For this machine, I want a VGA output instead of a composite output. Next, I'm not going to use dynamic RAM. I know this might be cheating a bit, but they're flaky and they're getting hard to find. Also, I don't really want to pull apart a working ZX Spectrum to get them. In the last video, we went over the differences between the ZX81 and the ZX Spectrum. High resolution graphics, up to a massive 48K of RAM, sound, and full 8 color capability. All available from £125. I give you the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. And we came up with this overall block diagram. In the Spectrum, the Z80 has direct access to the ROM, but it has to share access to the DRAM with the video circuit, which means there can be conflict between the CPU and video access to the memory. In the Spectrum, the video access is prioritised, so we don't get snow or streaks on the screen. In the inactive part of the display, the Z80 has unfettered access to the DRAM, but in the active area, the Sinclair engineers came up with an ingenious method of sharing the DRAM. During a 16 pixel block, which is 8 CPU clocks, the video circuit gets 4 memory reads in, while the CPU gets 1 read or 1 write in that cycle. Once you do the math, it means that the CPU is active for about 80% of the time. I'm not going to use this trick. For one thing, I need double the pixel clock to generate VGA, so I have another trick up my sleeve. Now, the SRAMs that are available are pretty fast compared to the DRAMs of yesteryear. A 628, 128, 128K byte SRAM comes in 50, 70, and 80 nanosecond versions, so that's a lot faster. What I'm planning to do is basically the same trick that Steve Wozniak used in the Apple II, which is to allow the CPU to have access to the memory for part of the clock cycle, while the video circuit has access for the other half. Now, this works really well on the 6502, and even better on the 65C02, where we have a bus enable signal and can literally disconnect the CPU from the bus for half the clock without any extra logic. I managed to do just that in the Apple II wire by wire series and I was able to get it to work. Here's Apple II Pac Man with the 65C02 and an EEPROM generating the raster signal. This is the overall architecture I used in the Apple II wire by wire build. It's a pretty straightforward architecture. We have an address bus and a data bus. The 65C02 is directly connected to both buses. While clock's low, some of the flip-flops store in the current screen location output onto the address bus, which drives the static RAM. We do a frame buffer lookup, and pixel data is sent to the shift register for output to the display. At the same time, the address also goes back into the video EEPROM, which outputs the address to the next pixel on the screen. On the positive edge of clock, this new address gets latched into the screen location flip-flops, ready for the next set of pixels. While clock slow, the CPU is prevented from driving the address bus using the bus enable signal. When the clock goes high, the bus enable signal is asserted, the CPU can drive the address bus, and the output from the screen location flip-flops is disabled. The CPU address goes to the static RAM or system EEPROM, it performs a read or a write. We flip between video access and CPU access to the memory once per clock cycle. If I can, I'd like to do something similar for the Spectrum. Now, that's really easy for the 65C02, but it's not so simple for the Z80. First, the Z80 memory cycle covers at least one clock for instruction fetch and one and a half clocks for general reads and writes. The other problem occurs during reads. For instruction fetches, the data is expected to be available on the rising edge of clock bar, but for general memory reads, the data is sampled on the falling edge of clock bar. Fortunately, writes look much easier. The data is available for a long time before we start the write, 
and right bar is asserted for an entire clock. In all cases, the address is also valid for a long time. So, how much time do we have to play with? Well, at 3.5 MHz, the clock duration is 280 nanoseconds, so we get 140 nanoseconds while the clock's high, and 140 nanoseconds while the clock's low. Plenty of time for both the 628128 static RAM and the 27C040 EEPROM, which itself has an access time of 100 nanoseconds. Looking at the diagram, I'm going to start off by trying to give the CPU access to the memory while clock's high, and the video circuit access to memory while clock's low. This is the architecture I'm planning to use for the Spectrum. It's actually very similar to the Apple II wire by wire design, except it has this wall of chips with tri state outputs that can isolate the Z80 from the memory system. The right half of the architecture is for video display, and I'll go over that in more detail in the next video. Let's look at the right pathway from the Z80 to the static RAM. We have a Z80 with a pair of 74HC245 buffers on the address lines. These are hardwired so that the address always goes from the Z80 to the memory, but we can turn the output off when clock bars low. Similarly, we have a 74HC245 on the data line. Again, this is hardwired to go from the Z80 to the memory. This is our write pathway. We can generate the output enable for this write data buffer by ORing together clock and write bar from the CPU. And we also use this as the write signal on the static RAM. But things get tricky for CPU reads, particularly instruction fetch reads. The CPU has access to the memory while clock bar is high, but the Z80 wants the data to be stable while clock bar is low. Hmm, that's a problem. If you have any ideas for a solution, stop the video now and write your answers in the comments. What I've chosen to do is to use an Octal D type flip flop which can latch the data from the SRAM on the falling edge of clock bar. The output from these flip-flops is fed back to the Z80. Now the trick here is I'm going to need Octal D-type flip-flops with tri-state outputs to avoid conflicts with the write pathway. A 74HC374 should do the trick, and I'll order together MREC bar and read bar from the Z80 to generate the output enable for the 74HC374. Let's look at what happens during an instruction fetch. The Z80 outputs the address, and while clock's high, this gets passed through to the static RAM. The SRAM performs a memory lookup, outputs the result on the data bus, and this is presented to the 74HC374 in the read pathway. On the negative edge of clock bar, which is the positive edge of clock, this is latched internally. Next, while clock bar's low, the same 74HC374 presents this data to the Z80. At the same time, the Z80 address bus buffers are disabled, and the outputs from the video address flip-flops are enabled. As a result, the current screen location is broadcast on the address bus. There's another static RAM lookup, this time it's pixel data, and this is stored in the display flip-flops. OK, that should work. For a main memory read, we'll perform a read here at the start of T2, latch the data, and it'll be presented to the Z80. But we'll perform a second read in T3 and latch the same data into the flip-flops again. Because we're latching the same data twice, the output from the flip-flops should still be stable when the Z80 needs the data. If worse comes to worse, I'll figure out a way of blocking the second read if that becomes necessary. In this system, there are actually going to be two EEPROMs. Both have far more capacity than I need. One will be the 27C4001, which is 512k bytes, and I only really need 16k of this for the system ROM. The other EEPROM is a 27C322, which is 2 meg by 16 bits, an admittedly huge EEPROM by ZX Spectrum standards. This is the video EEPROM, and I only really need 128k bytes of this capacity. All right, let's start the build. I'm going to use this perf board, which I've cut to fit inside an original ZX Spectrum case. I'm going to start with the CPU address bus. I have a pin header, which is going to act like the edge connector on the original ZX Spectrum itself. 
we have a pair of 74HC245s which can isolate the Z80 address bus from the memory address bus. Looking from underneath, we have the pin header, the Z80, and two 74HC245s. I'm going to start with the address bus connected to the Z80. It also connects to a pin header which I haven't shown on this diagram. I generally use one of three prototyping techniques. Breadboard builds, of which I have quite a few examples on the channel. Point-to-point -point wiring on perfboard, which is what I'm doing here. And the third technique is to make printed circuit boards. I like using this wire-to-wire -wire technique when I haven't quite figured out exactly how the circuit will look. But I want it to be permanent, and I want it to run at reasonable speeds. This circuit's meant to run at 3.5 MHz, which could be tempting fate on breadboards. Printed circuit boards are great, but there's little opportunity to modify them in any major way, and it can take a while for the boards to get here from China. That's the CPU address lines done. Now I'll leave some space for the static RAM and the system EEPROM. Let's start wiring this larger video EEPROM, which takes place of the ULA. Its output lines are connected to a pair of Octal D-type flip-flops, and these are the video address lines. This bus is shown here as two red arrows on the block diagram. I'll be showing most of the build in this video, but I'm only going to test the CPU section at low speed for now. The biggest unknown for me in this build is whether the Z80 will tolerate the interleave memory access. From all the data sheets and timing diagrams I've looked at, it looks good. But what's the old saying? In theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice they never are. I think this is the biggest risk for the project, and the bit that I've never tried before. Admittedly, I've done this in a slightly obscure order, but I'm going to wire up the memory data bus next. There is some method to the madness though. Basically, I want the short buses to be the deepest in the build, and I'll put the longer signals over the top. Here we see the system ROM, the RAM, a 74HC245 for the CPU write pathway, and a 74HC374 for the CPU read pathway. Finally, there's another 74HC374 to capture the video data. The trick I use with perf board wiring is to slightly pre-stretch the wire wrap wire, maybe by about 1% in length. Then, when I cut the Kynar shielding with the wire stripping tool, it's free to move over the wire. I secure it at one end, solder that in place, and then slide a piece of shielding into place. I wrap the wire around the socket pin, usually once but sometimes twice, solder it into place, and then slide the next piece of shielding. In this section, there are actually eight continuous pieces of wire, even though there are 40 contacts. Next, I want to connect up the main memory address bus. This starts at the 74HC245s connected to the Z80, connects to the static RAM and system EEPROM. From there, it goes to the address lines of the video EEPROM, and to the output of the latches connected to the video EEPROM. I've called these MA0 through 15 because these are the memory address lines. I've added in some wires that I'll end up ripping out later, mainly because I changed my mind about how I wanted the circuit to work. Of all the construction techniques, this is probably the trickiest. I learnt this wiring technique from the father of one of my high school friends. He hand-wired a Model 2 TRS-80 back in the early 80s using this technique, and it was very impressive at the time. The two main advantages over actual wire wrapping are, one, it's cheaper, because we get to use regular sockets, and two, for me at least, it's faster. One of the big downsides is that you can only connect two or maybe three wires to each pin, so you need to plan things out carefully, particularly where the buses will go. You also have to be careful about the order you wire in the contacts. It's much easier if you have free soldering iron access from at least one direction. It's these upper address lines that I'm wiring right now that I decided to change. I was wiring in a 74HC174, 
but I forgot that it had a reset signal rather than tri-state outputs. This means I'll be pulling up all these lovely wires. No matter. I'll replace this with a pair of 74HC257s. These are 2 to 1 multiplexer chips with tri-state outputs, and I'll go over this in the next video. The reason I'm showing you this is that you can make quite a large architectural change with this type of build philosophy. At worst, you lose a little bit of board area. Nearly there. The main thing left to do is wire up the data bus between the pin header, the Z80 itself, the 74HC245 for the write pathway, and the 74HC374 for the read pathway. The other important thing is to make sure you use high quality wire wrap wire for this type of build. It's worth the investment. I found Kynar to be the best. At some point, you're bound to touch something accidentally with the tip of the soldering iron, and the Kynar installation gives you 3 to 5 seconds before it melts through. I've previously bought cheap wire from China, and it melts instantaneously, exposing the wire inside and potentially creating a short. Just as an aside, the total build time from the recording timestamps was 5.5 hours. It's a bit slower than normal, because with the camera running I'm not free to move the board around as I want. Now I want to test this little puppy. Well, actually, this is my new little puppy who keeps me company while I edit these videos. I want to test this beastly build. I haven't told you this yet, but the size of the pin header and the way I connected it wasn't totally random. In fact, it's designed to connect up to an Arduino Mega 2560. It's a 36 pin header, and the lower 8 bits of the CPU address bus are connected to port C, the upper 8 bits are connected to port L, and the CPU data bus is connected to port A. I've also connected up some of the Z80 control lines to the other signals available. I'm using the CMOS version of the Z80 for this build, so in theory at least, I should be able to clock it very slowly with the Arduino. The main thing I want to figure out at this stage is whether the bus sharing idea works. Remember, the CPU has access when clock bar's high, and the video circuit has access when clock bar's low. The Z80 itself wasn't really designed to work this way. I've burnt the ZX Spectrum ROM into the 27C040, and I'll leave out the video EEPROM for the moment. I've written some Arduino code that snoops on the Z80 address bus and data bus, and if it sees a write between 4000 and 57FF hex, it sends the data back to the PC via the USB port. On the PC end, there's some C code that reads the USB port, then reassembles the address and data. Next, it does the address mapping the Spectrum uses for displaying pixels, and if appropriate, it writes this data to the screen. Let's see how we go. Excellent. Excellent! It looks like this bus sharing idea works, at least at low speed. Well, I think that's pretty good progress for this video. In the next video, I'll have a go at getting the scan out circuit to work. In the meantime, I would encourage you again to have a look at this VGA from an EEPROM video shown here. As always, don't forget to like, share and subscribe.